sort of talking a little bit about just my personal history and then how you can sort of apply that or at least, you know, just or <coughs> well, just to hear about what I've done and then maybe see how, you know, the you know, you can progress. Okay, so basically uh, friends took me out to a club that I think was about 1979, it was actually what's now DCM, it used to be called Patches, it had a much better sound system than it does now, <laughs> you remember the name? Um, and uh, it had a fantastic sound system, it was the like, first time, you know, getting into club and just remember hearing, you know, immaculate quality sound, massive big bass bins, awesome sound, and a guy who was just doing absolutely flawless, trickless mixing, you know, no, no Nothing extra, no cuts or anything like that, but just beautiful smooth mixing. Couldn't barely hear where one record ended and another one started, but the journey just continued. I was very entranced by that. It was already musical, like already like some playing instruments and things, but just was really entranced by that. And um, I was about 16 and had like a Pioneer belt drive with pitch control and some Tandy turntable and a Tandy mixer, you know. and. Uh, just muck around at home, feeling my way around it, sort of working this out for myself in my own mind, you know, and um, getting a rough idea on tempo and all sort of stuff, and in really being into and enjoying the music. And then um, at the time, I started picking up glasses in my pub up the road, which is now the, the Filler or Puma shop that was the Aubrey, and just pick up glasses there, and I had a DJ. And that was just a bar, so I didn't want to work there to people not dancing, but the DJ was telling me how you know, he's going overseas for a year. I said, well, he's going overseas for a year, he's leaving these three nights a week, but he's also quitting three nights a week down the road at uh, what is the, still the Exchange Hotel. That used to be more of a dance club than it is now. And so I went down and just said to him, have you thought of a replacement for you know, Timmy he's, when he goes overseas in three months? And this, they hadn't at that time. So he said, okay, I'll give you a go, so I think I can do a good job. Had a good feel for music and had myself already sort of underway. And then, you know, Got the job started and you know worked really well. Um, just playing good selection music, mixing well, crowd liked it, they were happy. And then one door, you know, closed another door opens. They, the people who owned Exchange also owned Patches and DCM. And their resin over the road was popping too many pills and knocking out too many drag queens. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was good, really. And then this was the guy who's, who actually inspired me into it. I have to say. Um, so it was a real shame that I just watched him sort of screw himself up. But I thought, ah, but I'll be smart. And, you know, they, so they moved me across the road. And after doing a few months of three nights there and three nights on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, this change, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, patches. Then eventually when he moved, uh, moved <coughs> there as a resident full time. So six nights a week, uh, you know, Monday to Saturday. And believe me, in the 80s, people went out every night of the week. People were very indulgent, very, you know, would go hard, <coughs> more hard than you could ever imagine. So people would basically, so basically, you know, from Monday to Wednesday, there'd be three or four hundred people in the club. And Thursday, there'd be six, seven hundred, and Friday, you'd have a thousand, and Saturday, you couldn't fit more than twelve hundred in, and turning away hundreds. So people were quite, you know, ferocious in their clubbing, and um, and but in terms of my progression, so I did that, which meant that I got to move up and down all of the clubs through Oxford Street, which at the time was pretty much the clubbing corner of you know Sydney. And then eventually, you know, obviously if you're doing a good job, people will, you know, pay attention both as clubbers and people running nights and things. So then it got us to, you know, to do a dance party here and there. Started they had dance parties at Pennington Town Hall. Then they started having dance parties at the Horden. But in terms of my progression, so it was like the <coughs> 80s exchange, which was music like electronic disco, but also um, new wave music. So the UK style, which was everything from like Erasure, Depeche Mode, you know, your zoo out in the ants, culture club, anything like that sort of sound mixed into also like club music that was at the time was coming from the States and Canada and all sorts of stuff. And then moving into the late 80s, music started to move into like the US house, Chicago house, Detroit, the house word, the word house started to appear, house music, which was terminology for the American club style. And then the big dance parties started happening at the Horton. And they were like a regular fixture, so that was a regular opportunity to play to five, six thousand people a week. And then at the end of that heyday, the, the, the rave sound started and um, got a taste for it. Thought, 
no one's ever going to employ me. I'm working in club land, not rave land. But I'd like to play rave music, you know, hear new, new sounds. It's refreshed to your ears. And um, so I thought, well, I'll just open my own rave club night, which I opened on a Wednesday. It was called Stun. Ended up being one of the longest running uh, Wednesday nighters or any club nighters in Sydney. It's still actually going. I'm not playing there anymore much, but it's uh, now at the moment it's the ice box that moved from like a great club that we used to be in the city called Neo Fair and moved to um, Sublime, the original Sublime in Pitt Street, which then moved <coughs> into home at Darken Harbour, and then and now it's the ice box. But anyway, so moving to Ray, opened the night, um, was already a competent experienced, skilled DJ, had been working for about 12, 13 years, but set up the night, and on the first night, as we opened, like literally, you know, it was the first time I played a rave set, so I had gone out, done my shopping, bought uh, the music that I wanted, the style promoted the night, etc, etc, and it was a success, and that was a way to, in a sense, build a little soapbox for me to get up and say, oh, you know, listen to me, listen to me, so in a sense, you've got to think a little bit, you've got to be creative, it's a creative job, and you've got to think, how do you creatively work your way into positions or into jobs, whether it's getting to know people or work out how a place functions and the people who function it or run it, you know. Um, and then when I was doing that, and of course, just by being competent and playing good stuff, people were enjoying it. And then people would say, well, oh, when are you going to be playing, when are you going to play a road? And I said, well, that's not going to happen. But, you know, because it was already like a, an A, it was like a glass ceiling to the a, A's DJs. And um, they were the people who were billed every week at every rave, and it was pretty much the same six or eight people. Um, but of course, after about eight, ten months of the night being a success, and this by then I'd already run quite a few different sort of club nights at different clubs, but this was like a new turning point. And then, um, literally at the time when I not so much to give it up, but never thought I would actually get us to <coughs> those the promoters started coming down to promote their weekend raves at the rave club night, and of course started to hear me and started to see the dance floor results and then and then eventually the first guy, one of the promoters said, can you play at my party? And I said, yes. And literally from that week, you know, on sort of got the chance to play at virtually every raid that happened because, you know, again, people were happy with what I was doing. So, you know, obviously you, you know, the, the skills and the talent came through, but you, you know, it's also a little bit about opportunity, right time, right place. So you do have to think ahead for yourself. Like if you're in your basement practicing, no one's even going to walk up to your door and knock on the door and say, we want you to play at our party or, you know, feature at our club. You've got to kind of think for yourself. You've got to, once you've got, you've got on top of your music, what style you like and working out the, the opportunities, like what clubs, what places, what spaces suit you, you know, then, you know, working out how you'd approach those people. Whether Obviously now it's a, a, a tiny bit harder because there's a bit more people jostling for the competition so there's the concept of say providing a demo you know it's not it used to be the way a, a smart person 10 years ago would try to get a job by handing someone a tape but now you know only one promoter said to me two weeks ago in Brisbane oh he said god he said I must get 20 CDs a week so there's 20 CDs or tapes and DJs who've all provided a set that's per week this is, this is a, a guy who's like the main promoter in Brisbane, so he does everything from big parties to ten, for 10,000 people to regular club nights to whatever. So you've got to then think, so what's the next way you'll get around that? So it's, it won't just maybe be a demo, it might be, um, you know, even if it's down to packaging, presentation, you know, like we've, all, we've moved on from cheap, shitty tapes to people being able to burn CDs and then people being able to label and stamp their CDs and maybe put a photo on of them working or, you know what I mean? So you've got to, you, you know, things will always be progressing. Um, I'll, I'll admit, three or four years into my career, I was thinking, this is great, you know, looking out over 5,000 people, or really whatever, thinking, but what I'll be doing in a few years, and I never would have thought that 23 years later, I'd, you know, it would actually have expanded to the point where now, sort of three or four weeks out of the year, I can, you know, get asked to a club anywhere around the country, in every city in Australia, plus country towns, plus Tasmania, plus New Zealand. And that's without aggressively pursuing anything else, like Southeast Asia or the UK, whatever. A lot of people just say, oh, do you play in London? No, haven't, oh, do you try? Well, I haven't really tried, but maybe if I tried, it might happen. So, you know, you never know what you could you could end up achieving. And also, too, there are uh, not every DJ's musician, not every musician's a DJ, vice versa, but it's moved into producing, always produced on and off, but uh, doing regular producing now, so devoting 
you know, cut out my midweek work to sort of have more time to be able to do long days. I've just come from this year today and then 10 hours there and working on stuff you probably know, Sophie Monk, the chick from Bardo, remixing her next single. So, you know, these things, and obviously, you know, that'll be my first job for a major. So it's like starting again, you know. So I've done the, with all the DJing, it's not over for me, but, you know, I don't mean to sort of talk about just myself, but I'm just trying to show you the kind of scope you can have. Like, you know, I haven't, apart from doing things like maybe teaching a class with them, but I haven't earned a dollar any other way than by playing records since I was 16. And I'm 38, so you sort of, you, you know, you just don't know <coughs> what you can do. And things that were different when I started, as I say, you didn't have a DJ mix school like this, you didn't have a choice of seven, eight, nine, ten import supply stores, specialist equipment suppliers, you know, people jostling you for take my mix and uh, like, buy our mix, buy our turntable. You know, there's a whole uh, range of choice now for you. And plus, in the past, um, pretty much the music that would be played in one of the clubs would be the music that would be in all the clubs and all the dance parties. And as you know now, you can pick and <coughs> choose what you want to hear and what you want to dance to and the, the kind of crowd you'd like to associate with, usually the same like minded people who like the same style of music. So in the way that it's also gotten a bit more jostling and a bit more busy, there's also many, many more, more opportunities. So <coughs> you know, I just only hope that all that dribble inspires you. Um, I will just ask, because oh, oh no, we've got about 20 minutes. Uh, first of all, any questions? Any, anyone, whether it's you know, personal or detail or anything to do with work? No? Okay, cool. All right, well, I'll just try and think of a couple more things I'd just like to wrap up with.